X bar and R charts are very commonly used for variables, but what happens if you can't use an X bar or an R chart? What happens if you have just one data point, for example? How do you take the average of one point? That's where different types of control charts come in, like IMR control charts. IMR control charts is actually a pair of control charts that's used like X bar and R charts. So let's take a look at when we should use the IMR chart pair and how to construct and analyze an IMR chart. First, what are IMR charts? Well, there are two charts. They are individual, that's the I, and moving range, that's the MR. So an individual chart is the simplest form of a variable control chart. You have only one measurement per point. So you don't really have subgroups in this case, you just have a single measurement. This is equivalent to an X bar chart. The moving range chart is paired with the I chart and it determines range and change in range. So this is how you take your single point and figure out, all right, what's my range? You can't have a range of just one number, but you can figure out from a series of single points what the overall range is in those points. You would use a moving range chart to prevent overcorrection of your process. So say you're looking in this individual chart and you go from this point here at 11 to this point here at 12. Well, just using those two points in your individual chart, you might say, uh-oh, my process is heading out of control very rapidly. I need to make a change. But if you look at the range here, your range is fairly high, but it's not near the upper limits yet. So that prevents you from making a very rapid change and possibly overcorrecting for a point that may be high just from natural variation in your process. You should use IMR charts in several occurrences. You can use them in batch processes when you have a single load of product coming out at the end of this batch. You take one measurement and then you don't take another measurement until the end of the batch. You can use them when you have a long time between data points. Now long time is not necessarily days or weeks. It could be 20 minutes or so. Let's say you take a temperature every 20 minutes. But those points may not be close enough together for you to be able to average them. So you can only plot a single measurement at a time. You can use them when testing is expensive. So either the test itself is expensive or the product is expensive to lose. So you only want to measure maybe one sample per time you test. You can also use them during automatic testing. So when you have automatic testing, you're testing basically every single piece of product you have. And in that case, subgrouping is less necessary because you are less likely to get variation between testing times than you are to get variation from your process or your product. So this is an example of reducing measurement noise. And that's our last one. So if you're getting variation in your samples, let's say your samples are very homogeneous, and so the difference you're getting is due to measurement error. Your balance doesn't weigh out exactly the same thing each time, or your pH meter may not read the exact same pH each time. So here, you're not really measuring true variation. You're getting variation from inspection. And you don't want to pick that up in a control chart and accidentally change your process when you don't have to. So in these cases, you use IMR charts. It just makes things easier. IMR charts are constructed in very similar ways to X bar and R charts. First thing you want to do after you get your data collected is calculate your central lines. Here your central line is just X bar. Remember you're only collecting single points per measurement so you don't have an average of averages, you just have an average of all of your points. Your MR average or your range average is MR bar and this is calculated a little bit differently. Let's take a look at this formula. So here we see XI minus XI, so XI minus one. What that means is that you need to wait until you have at least two points to start calculating a range. Makes sense, you need to tell the difference between one point and another. You can't do that in one point. 
So here you would take the sum of one point minus the point before it. So this would be, let's say you have four different points that you're calculating over the, the range of. And so you would say, okay, I'm adding point two minus point one plus point three minus point two plus point four minus point three. So that's three range measurements you have. And that's why you divide by the total number of measurements minus one because you only have one less than your total number of measurements. You can't get the range on your first point. So that's why you have k minus one in the denominator here. Notice these straight lines right here. These are absolute values. What happens if 0.3 is greater than 0.2, but it's also greater than 0.4? In one case, when you subtract 0.2 from 0.3, you get a positive number. But when you subtract 0.3 from 0.4, you get a negative number, and that's going to throw off your range. That's why we take the absolute value of our point minus the point before it. That lets us get consistent positive numbers, and so we can get a range whether that range is smaller um, for one side versus another. When you have your central lines, then you want to calculate your control limits. Your upper action limit and upper warning limit, lower action limit, lower warning limit, are calculated in a very similar way, again, to X bar and R charts. The only difference is your constants here and the fact that you use your moving range instead of your regular range. So you're using your average plus or minus three times your moving range divided by D2 for your upper and lower action limits and two times your moving range divided by D2 for your warning limits. D2 is a constant and it can be found in the appendix of your book. Your upper and lower action limits and warning limits for your moving range chart are calculated using the same constants used for your R charts, but Again, you're multiplying by the average moving range. Once you put your chart together, they're also analyzed in the same ways as your X bar and R charts. Now, you need to be careful here because you may see runs or cycles that are not actually problems. So looking at this chart, you see a little bit of cycling going on. That can happen because remember, when we calculated our moving range, each point was related to the point before it. So our points are automatically sort of related to each other. And if we have one point that stands out, it's going to affect the points around it. So you need to remember that when you see a run or a cycle, double check and make sure that's not actually a problem. It may be a problem, but it may just be an effect of particular points on your chart. Another thing to keep an eye on is you may want to use the median, not the mean, if you have wide outliers on your chart. And this is for the moving range chart. So remember, you're taking po the point minus the point before it. If you have something that is very, very high or very, very low, it's going to throw off your range. Same thing with your eye chart. If you have, for example, one measurement that is very high or very low, you can throw off that center line. So to get a true estimate of your center line, if you tend to have large outliers in your process, you may use the median or the value where half of the values are higher of it, half are lower than it instead of the mean, just to get a more reasonable estimate of where the true process mean actually is. Other than that, IMR charts are quite useful for monitoring your process, just like X bar and R charts, and they are a little bit easier to put together and to collect data for. You don't have quite as much data to deal with. So you can monitor your process just as well with IMR charts as with XBAR and R charts.